Thank you all so much for being here today. My name is Kelsey Davenport. I'm the Director for Nonproliferation Policy at the Arms Control Association, and I'm honored to have the opportunity to lead a deeper dive into the discussion of the nuclear deal with Iran. Now, we've already heard quite a bit about the agreement this morning. Congresswoman Lee and Senator Feinstein, in particular, noted the nonproliferation value of the deal. They reiterated that Iran is abiding by its commitments and that the agreement remains in the U.S. national security interest. Despite these facts, President Trump chose to withhold a key certification tied to the deal to Congress on October 13th, and he directed his administration to work with Congress to try and find ways to fix the deal. This, of course, is an approach that Washington's multilateral partners have rejected. Now, to dive into these issues and to share with us their thoughts on the current situation and the risks going forward, we are lucky to have three well-renowned scholars on the topic. I will not read their full bios because that would take me the full 45 minutes for our panel, so I will direct you to your programs and merely say that we are very fortunate to have Hussein Musavian of Princeton University, Colin Call of Georgetown, and Jessica Matthews of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace for today's discussion. So to start, I want to turn over to you, Colin, to talk a little bit about the current situation and where the president has outlined his path forward and what the risks are for the Iran deal, given what he set up on October 13th. Great. Well, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Kelsey. Uh, thanks to Joe and everybody at Plowshares, and thank all of you for coming here. Um, look, essentially what Trump did was kick the issue to Congress and ask Congress to uh, craft legislation that I think would do a couple of things. One is to get him out of the 90-day requirement to continuously validate a deal that he's called the worst deal ever, along with the TPP being the worst deal ever and the Paris Climate Accord being the worst deal ever and NAFTA being the worst deal ever. There are a lot of really bad uh, deals out there. So I think he just wants to get away from that. In fact, I think the entire decertification play was largely to manage the president's temper, um, that he threw a fit uh, having to do this every 90 days. Um, so I think that's largely a cosmetic fix that they'll change the certification requirements. The more substantive fix uh, is or uh, issue is what Senators uh, Corker and Cotton are working on, which is essentially uh, to craft legislation, at least in its current form, and I suspect it'll change, but in its current form that would uh, outline a series of automatic triggers for reimposing uh, nuclear-related sanctions that were suspended under the JCPOA, the Iran deal, in the event that Iran engages in certain types of behavior that we don't like but isn't technically prescribed uh, 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 by the Iran deal. So, uh, for example, if they um, engage in certain ballistic missile tests, um, which is covered under a UN Security Council resolution but not under the deal itself, uh, the sanctions could uh, snap back. If they make developments in their nuclear program at any point, which drives the breakout timeline below 12 months, um, uh, the sanctions would automatically snap back, even though at the eight-year, 10-year, and 15-year point, uh, Iran is allowed to do certain activities, which under the normal course of business would probably drive the breakout time uh, lower. So I think the, the problem that the Europeans and our other negotiating partners, and most certainly the Iranians, will have with this is that it will be rightly perceived as a unilateral effort to renegotiate the terms of the deal and to try to legislate elements that weren't part of the deal and that in many cases are outside the four corners of the deal. And I just asked the people in the room uh, to go through the following thought experiment. What if tomorrow the Iranians uh, 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 declared that unless the United States completely pulls out uh, its 7,000 forces from Iraq and Syria within the next two months, they will reimpose their nuclear program? Right? Uh, under the argument that, our, that after ISIS has been defeated, the presence of our forces in Iraq and Syria are a threat to regional peace and security. I don't agree with that, but the Iranians uh, make that argument. And therefore violate the spirit of the deal, which was, there, which was meant to promote peace and security in the region, which is the argument that the Trump administration uses about the spirit of the deal. And as a consequence, uh, because the United States is now in violation of the spirit of the deal, Iran is free to renege on its obligations unless the United States pulls out of Iraq and Syria. Raise your hand if you think most members of Congress would see that as a unilateral violation of the deal. <laughs> it's, it's an important thought experiment because that's exactly how the rest of the world will perceive the current Corker-Cotton legislation. And, and the last irony is, if you believe Bob Corker, and I do, uh, that the president is erratic uh, and that his temperament uh, is uh, dangerous, um, I wouldn't want to... Uh, give this president a, a set of legislation that tees him up uh, to bring this deal crashing down. 
Um, and the good news is I think the Demo uh, Democrats on the Hill understand this, and Senator Car Cardin in particular is, I think, holding Democrats in the Senate firm that they will not pass any legislation uh, that violates the JCPOA, and nor will they pass legislation that, is, that puts us uh, at loggerheads with the Europeans, because I think they understand that the deal is unsustainable if we don't have the Europeans with us, and there's no prospect of generating international consensus to push back against Iran's other behavior that we don't like in the absence of a transatlantic uh, agreement on what, that, uh, what those steps are. So I think the Democrats are in a good place, but we are in a very uh, uncertain moment. One thing that Trump said, though, was that if Congress does not take these steps to fix what he views as flaws in the deal, that he will take steps then to terminate the agreement. Do you view that as a real risk? And what could the United States actually do unilaterally to the deal by the president himself? Well, it, it is a real risk uh, because the president himself is erratic. That said, it's hard to take any threat that he makes seriously because his negotiating style tends to be to put a bunch of threats on the table and then not execute any of them. Uh, uh, and I don't. I, apparently that worked for him in business, uh, where he was able to take people to court and sue them and, uh, and or settle on issues or whatever. It's not working for him thus far. He's torn up a lot of, uh, he has torn up a, lo a lot of deals, so there is the prospect of him, him uh, doing that, but he hasn't shown thus far uh, a, a willingness to carry through on a bunch of threats that he's made uh, to Congress, et cetera. So I have no idea. Um, if he does it, it would be an, a, a gaping self-inflicted wound on the national interest of the United States, um, he could do it in a number of ways. For one thing, all the nuclear-related uh, sanctions can be reimposed through executive order. He doesn't need Congress to snap them back. Uh, and in fact, he could reimpose the UN sanctions as well uh, by triggering a mechanism under the under the deal and the and, and the accompanying UN Security Council resolution that will allow the United States to introduce a resolution in the Security Council calling for a vote on the continued suspension of UN sanctions, and then we would veto our own resolution, and that would snap the, the sanctions back. Uh, that was meant to be an effective enforcement mechanism uh, to be used in the hands of a responsible uh, administration. Um, I'll let you judge as to whether you view the current administration as such an entity. But if, if uh, Trump decides to tear the deal down, he can do it. Um, and while I think that uh, d in the current moment, him distancing himself from the deal leaves the rest of the deal relatively intact, and I, I would you know, uh, defer to other people on the panel about whether the Iranians will stay in. I think they probably will under the current circumstances, but in a world where he unilaterally snaps back all the sanctions through executive order or tears down the agreement through the UN, then the agreement is dead. Despite that prospect, the Europeans and others have said they will remain committed to the deal irrespective of U.S. actions. And the uncertainty that's being created around the deal is something that the Europeans have also responded to as destabilizing. So Jessica, I now want to ask you for your analysis of what the uncertainty that Trump has created around this deal is doing for U.S. alliances, particularly in Europe, and what the situation is looking like in the Middle East now, given the President's decision. Well, uh, for Sam, yeah, um, I think they have managed to craft something I don't believe I've ever seen before, which is a policy that has only downsides. I, I cannot identify a single, even even one I don't agree with. But I mean, I can't. I literally can't can't find uh, a benefit. Um, Starting kind of with the most ground level effect, um, already there's been damage done, significant damage done, because the effective enforcement of the deal depends on confidence within all the participants in what's called the Joint Commission that oversees enforcement, that when somebody raises a question, um, that they are doing it in the spirit of effective, rigorous enforcement and not in an effort to undermine or destroy the deal. And I would say that that damage is already done um, about U.S. intentions and, and desires. Um, it could be rebuilt, but it's certainly done. Uh, there is already uh, damage done with respect to the balance of power political power within Iran and a shift uh, to the hardliners, um, and, and Hussein can, can speak to that. Um, uh, it would obviously become much more acute if um, uh, we actually p 
pulled out. Um, we have already opened a rift across the Atlantic. Uh, Europeans are understandably um, confused and appalled uh, at something that was negotiated uh, with such effort and over so many years um, with U.S. leadership and with such success. I mean, when you think about the P5 plus one, three European countries, the U.S., China, and Russia, agreeing, um, I must say while these negotiations were going on, I always believed the Russians were going to torpedo them at the last moment uh, because the Russians have very divided uh, interests here, and, and, uh, but they didn't. Um, so the rift is already there. Um, the Europeans are in a very tight box because they really believe in this agreement. Um, there has already been substantial European investment in Iran since the sanctions were lifted. Big companies, Total, Peugeot, Renault, Airbus, Siemens, um, uh, and those investments are now thrown into doubt depending on what the U.S. does, and they have no way of knowing what the U.S. does. Um, Russia gets two gifts. Uh, it is in the Russian interest, and they spend a lot of effort pursuing it to open a rift uh, between the U.S. and the European countries. And Russian relations inside Iran um, are tightest with the IRGC, with the Revolutionary Guard, who are going to be relatively strengthened versus the moderates by the U.S. throwing this deal into doubt. So Russia gets benefited twice. Um, if the U.S., if the deal goes forward uh, without the U.S., but stays in effect, that is, Iran makes a decision that overall its interests are better preserved by sticking with, I'm skeptical that that will happen, but say it did happen. Um, the U.S. is, of course, isolated internationally. Um, Iran is strengthened its credibility internationally and um, by the fact that it had negotiated this deal, abided by it, and stuck with it. Um, and I wouldn't be at all surprised to see a more aggressive policy in the region, Iranian foreign policy in the region. So another exactly opposite outcome to what we desire. And then depending on what we do with secondary sanctions, with the use of sanctions against those who invest with Iran, we could very easily end up jeopardizing the long-term status of the dollar as the world's reserve currency. Uh, this would be another gift to Russia, but especially to China. Um, so uh, it's very hard to, uh, and I'm going to say I, ca I can't find one, to, to figure out any, uh, well, and I should mention just one other obvious one, which is that if you are worried about what happens eight years from now when the first sanctions, the first sunset provisions uh, come into effect, why would you want to move that date forward? It's, it's totally twisted logic. It makes, I mean, when you actually confront it and say, well, it, it, and, and I should just mention that I, I do happen to know that the president said to another foreign president in recent weeks the phrase, um, uh, well, under this deal, eight years from now, Iran will be a nuclear power. This is, this, we, we are dealing with a president who does not know what this deal is. And I have to say, I would guess that most members of Congress also don't know what's actually in this deal. It's 150 pages long. And it's for sure that most Americans have no idea. Um, most of the criticism of the deal, um, the deal that you hear criticized bears very little resemblance to the deal that's actually been signed and is in effect. The one outcome that they're count they seem to be counting on, 
that will not happen is, and Colin has written a brilliant piece called The Myth of the Better Deal, is that there will be a better deal. Uh, Secretary Tillerson, in his briefing to the press right before the president's speech, said, we will put some teeth in this or else let's forget the whole thing, we'll walk away and start over. That's a fantasy. That won't happen. And uh, it, it's hard to imagine why he thinks it would, short of war. So, uh, you know, the, the, final, the final consequence here, of course, is that if the deal does fall apart, we are back to where we were in 2013 um, uh, with a little more, uh, a little longer breakout time, significantly longer. Uh, but um, looking at a choice between a nuclear Iran or war. Because the choices then, there were only three, was a negotiated deal, uh, and living with a nuclear Iran, which is not impossible but highly undesirable, uh, or war with a country more than twice the size of Iraq. So that looks to me like, um, like the uh, likely menu of outcomes of this policy and uh, as I said, I can't at least identify a single positive in that agenda. Well, on that depressing note. <laughs> I do want to follow up, though, because you mentioned China briefly, and China's role in the deal does not get a lot of attention here in Washington. Some have described the work that the United States put into p getting China on board with U.S. sanctions on Iran as China testing out pursuing shared strategic interests with the United States. So if the United States walks away from this deal, what are the implications for the U.S.-China relationship, and how does that impact our ability to make progress on issues like North Korea? Well, it's, uh, I'm glad you, you mentioned it because anybody who's been following uh, the party congress in Beijing over the last two weeks um, knows that this is a moment of, of enormous significance and apparent change in, Congre in China. <laughs> congress. Um, she has been written into the Chinese constitution as equivalent to Mao. He has solidified his power to an enormous degree he has, in his choice of the new membership of the Standing Committee um, of the Politburo, um, made clear that he will pursue the very aggressive foreign policy in the South China Sea that he has been doing over the last, um, and, and perhaps intensify. Um, this is very much less, this new China, a, uh, a country being ruled by a committee of nine or seven and a country being ruled by one. Um, at the same time, uh, we ha we they are deploying their economic and diplomatic strength and made it very clear that any vacuum the U.S. creates by pulling back in international leadership, they will step forward to fill. And so the China has now portrayed itself over the last year and surely will continue to do so as the leading advocate of globalization and of multilateral problem solving. Um, and, uh, and so they, they, will, they will fill uh, the, the vacuums that we leave. And at the same time, with the U.S. withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific uh, Trade Deal, the TPP, China is moving to um, uh, strengthen its trade relationships and its, therefore, its economic and diplomatic power over uh, its Asian, um, uh, the other Asian states. So th what's happened here doesn't stand alone from a, um, a time when China is looking at playing for the first time a, a really active, perhaps leadership role um, in world affairs and in multilateral leadership, a, a position the U.S. has occupied since 1945. So this deal, uh, th the fate of this deal is not unrelated uh, to those changes.
Thank you. Yes, I think it's critical that we remember that the consequences go far beyond just Iran's nuclear program. I now want to take us to Tehran, or at least as close to Iran as we can get to here in Washington, and ask Hussein to tell us a little bit about how different political factions within Tehran are responding to the developments in the United States and here in Washington, and where you see Iran moving forward on this issue now. Thank you, Kisli. I First of all, let me to thank Joe, Plosher, everybody in this room who supported the Iranian nuclear deal to manage a crisis in a peaceful way. Um, describing Iranian policy in Washington is not easy. You, everyone understands. But this is my job. Since Revolution 1979, two issues has been the most critical, challenging, domestic political issue in Iran. One, relation with the US, and second, the nuclear deal. You cannot find any other two issue domestically with so much challenges. We have two big factions like the US Democrats, Republicans, since Revolution 1979, the two big factions, they agree that the U.S. is after regime change and you cannot trust the U.S. There is no dispute. However, one fraction believes that you can negotiate with U.S. based on mutual respect, mutual interest, non-interference, and international norms and regulations and agree on some of the disputes at least. Practically they say US is negotiable. The other faction says since you cannot negotiate with the US, you should not negotiate, you should not agree, you should not trust. Because first of all the US, since the US is after regime change, they don't have any respect for principles like mutual respect, mutual interest, or interference, non-interference, and so Second, they insist the US does not respect the international norms and regulations, and they treat international norms and regulations, regulations selectively, not comprehensively without double standard. Third, they have been always saying that the U.S.-Iran policy, and to some extent the U.S.-Middle East policy is decided in Tel Aviv, not in Washington. And they discuss a lot, you can read hundreds of articles in Iranian paper about the role of petrodollars in Washington decision making. Therefore, they say practically Washington is not independent, either the petrodollars or uh, Tel Aviv is mm, uh, playing the key role. Therefore, how we can trust, how we can negotiate, how we can agree. During Obama, the situation was going to a direction to bring some of the politicians to rethink. Because Obama said, we are not after regime change. We, are, we, we respect the rights of Iran for peaceful nuclear technology like other members. Our red line is nuclear bomb. And they started, one of the friends who, is, who negotiated is here. It was very difficult negotiations, but they agreed. There was some other progress in Iran-US relations. Therefore, there was the beginning of rethinking at least on some politicians on the, on, uh, on the principles which whether you can negotiate, you can agree or not. But when President Trump came, since he is in office, what practically he has done? First of all, he showed he has no respect for what the US signed, what the US agreed. This is exactly what the other school of thought in Iran always had been insisting. You cannot trust the US even what to, they, to what they sign. 
Second, he shows no respect for International Atomic Energy Agency, who is responsible for implementation of the deal, and at least eight times since 2015 has confirmed Iran has fully complied with its commitment within the nuclear deal. Trump doesn't, it doesn't matter for him. Third, he shows he has no respect for United Nations uh, Security Council resolution because the deal is international deal. More, it has a UN resolution. And he doesn't care about UN resolution also. Fourth, he is insisting on regime change. Therefore, when you are insisting on regime change, it means you are going to go for full confrontation, even short of war. Everything President Trump has done is a complete confirmation of the other school of thought in Iran. Therefore, today, the two big factions with President Trump, they agree you cannot negotiate with the US, you should not trust the US because the US does not respect its signature, does not respect international norms, does not respect international organizations, does not respect a United Nations Security Council resolution. Therefore, it's useless to negotiate with the US on any other issue. However, I received uh, last night an email from a graduate, Columbia University graduate, I just want to show you it is not Iranian inside who are very sensitive. We have hundreds of thousands of Iranians living in the US and how they are sensitive and careful following this issue. He wrote me, I, I have his email here. He wrote me, Ambassador, Prime Minister Netanyahu in his speech September at the United Nations said, our policy about Iranian nuclear deal is clear, either to cancel or change it. If you cannot cancel it, get rid of the sunsets, missile, and uh, sophisticated centrifuges. And this is exactly what President Trump is doing. And he declared in October Iran policy. And he sent me three articles. One article written by uh, uh, Adel Zubair, the um, uh, Saudi uh, um, uh, foreign minister, Can Iran Change, published at New York Times, January 19, 2016. The second article, again from Adel Zubair, Wall Street Journal, uh, 19th, uh, September 19, 2016. And the last one is from uh, Michael Oren, the former Israeli ambassador at the UN, published at NYT, United uh, New York Times. Uh, the title is, uh, The Iran Nuclear Deal is Not Worth Saving. He has done a very quick research. He sent it to me in an email. What Trump stated on Iran policy is totally, completely, copy-pasted from these, these speeches, or these articles. Even he, he, they, they did not change the word. Read the Trump uh, statement on October. Compared with these three articles, you would find every paragraph is totally duplicated, copy-pasted from these, th these three articles. Therefore, how we can then, then trust? So given that these two factions in Iran now have been driven together by the US policy towards Iran. Do you see that there is any chance for negotiation on issues outside of the deal? I mean, it's interesting that the three EU ministers, uh, that Macron, May, and Merkel said that perhaps we might be able to negotiate on ballistic missiles, but is there space in Iran now, given how they view where the United States has taken its Iran policy? First of all, for the Iranians, the first criteria would be whether this deal already agreed would be precisely implemented or not. If not, forget everything else. 
And this was what the Iranian Supreme Leader said uh, perhaps two years ago. He said, we would test Americans. If they are sincere on what we agree, then we may think about negotiating on other issues. He said publicly. Second, negotiating an Iranian missile, what does mean this? To prevent Iran from its uh, defensive uh, 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 power. While the US policy on regime change continues, while the US is exporting hundreds of billions of dollars of the most sophisticated arms to Iranian Arab neighbors, while Iran has been invaded and Arabs, Americans, they have already supported Saddam during eight years war. When Iran has been attacked by weapons of mass destruction, the US provided material and technology. Hundreds of thousands of Iranians during war, uh, chemical weapon has been killed or injured. While Iran, every border around Iran is threatened by the crisis, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran is living in the most problem problematic area in the world. 80% of international crises are around Iran. ISIS, everything. Do you really expect Iran to forego its military, conventional military uh, strength? It is impossible. It is impossible. No one would negotiate about the military conventional arms, military ex uh, strength of the country. Because the country is at the center of all international threats and problems from the US to the regional issues, Iraq, ISIS, Afghanistan, Pakistan, NATO, everything. I want to bring Colin in on this question of ballistic missiles, though. And not just ballistic missiles, but another area of the deal that frequently is criticized by opponents of the deal, but also is a concern for the deal's supporters. And that is what happens when the so-called sunset provisions expire. And sunset's frequently referring to the restrictions that phase out over time, and when Iran can begin to build up its uranium enrichment problem. So what do you say to those people who are concerned about the out years of the agreement? And do you agree with, with Hussein that there may not be space to negotiate on ballistic missiles right now? And if so, what the, should the United States do on that? Because it's clearly a concern that continues to drive congressional action. Yeah, no, it's a great question, Kelsey. Uh, first of all, I think most people in the room understand, but it's worth reiterating that there are important elements of this deal that never sunset. Right? Iran's obligation not to build a nuclear weapon under this deal and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty never sunsets. The intrusive inspections of Iran's uh, uh, declared nuclear facilities under their safeguards agreement with the IAEA never sunsets. The additional protocol which they are implementing and will ratify at year eight, assuming that we lift uh, the sanctions at, at, at year eight, never sunsets, which means the IAEA will be able to request access to uh, undeclared and suspicious activities forever. Why do I mention that? Because in the history of nonproliferation, not a single country has ever built a nuclear weapon while being under the additional protocol. All right? So the transparency mechanisms under this deal never sunset. Now, a few of them atrophy over time. The access to uranium mines and mills uh, uh, at year 20, uh, uh, centrifuge facilities, assembly and production facilities at year 25 of the deal. I may have that backwards of 25, 20, but nevertheless, about over the next quarter century. But the core transparency mechanisms never sunset, nor Iran's obligation not to build a nuclear weapon. The concern is that at year eight, they're allowed to do some uh, additional R&D, although if you talk to people like Ernie Moniz back when we had secretaries of energy who are world-renowned nuclear physicists, uh, uh, but maybe not as good at dancers, um, uh, that Ernie will tell you that there's nothing in, in what they're allowed to do at year eight uh, that will um, uh, allow their breakout timeline to, to go down. So the real issues that people point to are at years 10 and 15. At years 10, when, they're allowed to, uh, when Iran is allowed to start building and installing uh, more centrifuges, uh, and then at year 15, when the cap on low-enriched uranium which is currently at 300 kilograms, which is about one-fourth of what you would need for a nuclear weapon if you uh, enriched it to weapons-grade uh, uh, levels, um, is lifted. 
Uh, now, I will say a president of the United States or a prime minister of Israel or anybody else who's worried about this is still probably in a better position in 2025 and 2030 than Barack Obama was in 2013, to Jessica's point. Uh, and raise your hand if you would like to buy 10 or 15 years on the North Korean nuclear issue right now. <laughs> right, okay, so uh, anyway, um, so th but the question is, would it, all else being equal, would it be nice to be able to uh, get rid of the sunset uh, provision? So you could think of this in different ways. You could extend the constraints uh, forward to make them um, either much longer or permanent. Perhaps you actually don't, uh, perhaps you would tie the constraints to Iran's practical needs. The reality is that Iran uh, only has one uh, operational reactor for electricity, Bushir. They get all the fuel from international actors. They have no need uh, to produce uh, uh, fuel for that. They, uh, the Iranians want to build additional reactors, but they haven't built any of them uh, yet. And so you may be able to come to an agreement that doesn't prevent Iran from uh, engaging in fuel cycle activities, but ties it to, uh, pract to practical requirements tied to how big the rest of their, nu their civilian nuclear industry is. And that would elongate the constraints for probably several decades, um, given how hard this uh, stuff is. But I will say, doing that will be tough. Getting follow-on agreements or supplemental agreements, nobody's going to renegotiate the deal. Okay, The deal is the deal. The Europeans aren't going to reopen it. The Iranians aren't going to reopen it. The Russians, the Chinese, nobody's going to renegotiate the deal. The question is whether a follow-on or supplemental set of arrangements is possible that extends some of this stuff out. The answer is yes, but it will be hard. This last deal took seven years of concerted negotiation and a failed round of negotiation before under the Bush administration when Rouhani and Zarif were involved as negotiators uh, back in the 2003-2005 uh, period when the E3 uh, uh, were taking the lead. So this took a long time. Now the good news is this deal buys at least 10 or 15 years for us to have steady, patient, mature, carefully thought out, carefully coordinated diplomacy. That doesn't seem to be the watchword for this particular administration. Um, they've replaced strategic Im uh, 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 patience with uh, you know, impatience and, and tantrum uh, throwing. Uh, but nevertheless, um, it's going to take a while, and the good news is we have a while. But I will say that the mentality, and I will come up with one argument that Jessica, the argument that they make is that they'll reconstitute pressure, which will generate a better deal. The reason why that's not persuasive is that they won't reconstitute pressure if the rest of the world won't come with us, and you can't generate 150% of the current deal with less than 100% of the leverage we had before the deal. It's just mathematically impossible. So they have an argument, it's just a bad one. Uh, uh, and so a pressure only strategy isn't going to work because you're not going to get the level of pressure required. And frankly, why would the Iranians cave to the pressure uh, and threats if they don't uh, expect the United States to follow up on its uh, 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 side of the bargain? And by the way, I don't think threats uh, uh, in and of themselves work anyway. So I think you're gonna have to uh, think about a more for more framework that would say, okay, you're gonna ex either extend constraints or tie it to practical needs in exchange for what? A lifting of the primary US embargo, access to the US banking system, which the Iranians currently don't have, Maybe you look at the nuclear side. Would we be willing to sell them or provide them with state-of-the-art nuclear reactor technology in exchange for not enrichment? Would we be willing to try to regionalize and generalize elements of the JCPOA so that it applies throughout the Gulf region, so that it doesn't just apply to Iran, and then come up with an international consortium on enrichment or research? There's all sorts of creative ideas in the more-for-more more space. Uh, but that's going to take time and also an, a, 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 an administration that's willing to engage the Iranians in this uh, a, a action. The last point I'll make, and I'm sorry for taking so long, talking so long, but this president fancies himself as the master of the art of the deal. Deals require actual human beings to negotiate. This administration is running a giant experiment of running a government without human beings. They have a cabinet and they have civil servants many of which are, are brilliant and, and dedicated patriots who are denigrated as the deep state and nobody in between, right? The JCPOA on a day-to-day -day basis wasn't negotiated by Barack Obama or John Kerry, it was negotiated by Wendy Sherman. Who is the Wendy Sherman in this administration? Who are the people who are assistant secretaries, undersecretaries, deputy secretaries, ambassadors, people who have uh, the trust of the President of the United States and are respected uh, around the world because they reflect what the administration is doing? No one. And so I don't even know how they would negotiate a better deal with actual human beings if they could generate the incentive structure to do such. But other than that, it's going to work out great. <laughs> yeah. Jessica, yeah. yes, real quick. Yeah, I wanted to make two more points about the sunset issue. First of all, the 15-year, which is now 13 years since we're two years in, 
uh, limit on the 300 kilograms of low-enriched uranium is really the key, and because it's it, um, 300 kilograms, you can't do anything weapons-wise, as Collins just said. So 13 years is a very long time in diplomatic terms. One of the things that will absolutely definitely happen is that the revolutionary generation in Iran will be largely gone for reasons of age. Um, Iran is slowly transitioning uh, into a post-revolutionary phase, um, more led by national interest and by um, a different generation, which is better educated, highly unemployed, looking for ways to use their skills, um, and, dis and tired of being internationally um, isolated. Uh, so that's something you could count on. Um, this policy offends exactly the demographic we should be reaching out towards. Um, you, you may have read recently both Apple and Google dropped Iranian written apps that have been, the uh, software that has been written by younger generation Iranians because they were worried about what might happen with sanctions. So what we're doing is providing gifts to the IRGC and alienating um, the people who's, whom we hope will inherit and lead a, a different Iran. The other point that's worth remembering is that arms control agreements almost never uh, are made when they're first um, uh, agreed to permanent right off the bat. Why? Because countries are giving up military assets and that's scary and risky. And so generally they are temporary. Uh, the non-proliferation treaty, the long pole and the non-proliferation tent around which the whole global regime is built was originally only a 25 year commitment. That's all that could be negotiated. And it wasn't until the very end of those 25 years that by then nearly 200 countries agreed to make it permanent. So there's nothing at all unusual about having to proceed um, step by step, incrementally. And uh, that's important to, uh, to remember. I want to open it up for questions now. I'm going to ask that you abide by the trinity of question asking. Please tell us your name. Please ask a question. And please keep it short. Uh, I think I saw Bob Einhorn in the back. Einhorn uh, from Brookings. Uh, this is really to, to Hussein. Um, you know, Colin talked about a uh, more for more framework in which you know various U.S. concerns could be addressed about the so-called out years, the sunset provisions, ballistic missiles, and so forth. Uh, I think uh, Hussein, you know what the U.S. side would seek uh, in that more for more framework. Uh, what would uh, Iran seek? Um, Colin mentioned, you know, scaling back certain uh, non-nuclear sanctions, the primary uh, U.S. sanctions that prevent U.S. entities from uh, dealing with Iran. Um, what, um, what would Iran seek? And can you imagine Iran engaging, not now when the tensions are so great and so forth, but down the road, can you imagine that kind of uh, negotiation? Bob, I think you negotiated the deal for years and you know very well that all sunsets are beyond non-proliferation treaty. Iran is the only country in the world, member state of NPT, who has accepted the terms and conditions beyond non-proliferation treaty, which we call it sunsets from eight to 25 years. There is no other country on the planet, number one. Number two, Bob, again, you know, Iran has accepted the most comprehensive, intrusive inspections. No other country in this world has accepted such a level and extent of inspections and transparency measures on nuclear in framework of this deal, because this deal practically is the most comprehensive deal during the non-proliferation. What 
does mean that? Are we going to discriminate Iran as a member of NPT after 25 years to be the only country in the world to be deprived, to be discriminated under non-proliferation treaty? Would it be really helpful? I don't believe that would be helpful. I don't believe Iranians they would accept. I, th I think what, what Bob was getting at though is will they, would you be willing to voluntarily go beyond Exactly, this is what I say. I say Iran as a confidence building measures is the only country accepted many terms, conditions, measures beyond non-proliferation treaty for eight to 25 years already. We should appreciate it first. Then if you're going to think more, if you're really sincere as, as, as what, what Colin said, if you're really sincere about nuclear weapon free zone in Middle East, the terms and conditions and the principles of this deal, if it is going to be regionalized, then this would be permanent a restriction for everybody, at least in the Middle East. You would not singleize just one country, you know, this would be humiliating for a big nation like Iran after even 25 years forever to be discriminated under one international treaty which is non-proliferation treaty. The goodwill for goodwill, Bob, can continue. We have chance. I, don't, I, I really don't believe with President Trump policy, zero. I, the chance is zero. Just but for goodwill to goodwill, First of all, complete, precise uh, implementation of the deal would be already a good signal for the Iranians to go ahead. Second, the big issue today in Washington for Trump, for US allies, is not that much about nuclear, it's about the regional issues. And Iran is playing the key role. Therefore, Europeans, Russians, Chinese, they are already engaged with Iran on uh, regional issues, uh, negotiations, dialogues. This is something I believe the, the international powers should engage to bring peace and stability, and Iranians, they would be cooperative. Colin, did you want to jump in there quickly? Just very quickly. I mean, this is why I'm not talking about necessarily extending this deal. I mean, we have a nuclear one, two, three agreement with the UAE, for example, where we provide extensive nuclear cooperation in exchange for an agreement on their behalf never to enrich uranium, right? So there is a possibility of a win-win uh, in, uh, in which you provide extensive nuclear technology in exchange for a voluntary commitment not to do this. And there are lots of states around the world that have uh, viable nuclear programs that don't enrich uranium. So uh, it is conceivable without signaling out Iran as a pariah as a consequence. But I do think that Hossein's point about uh, generalizing this and regionalizing it, I, I think a nuclear weapons free zone is probably not the way to do it, but rather uh, thinking about it in terms of the positive uh, aspects of nuclear energy and research and trying to figure out consortiums and a set of associated constraints that not only apply to uh, Iran, but to Iran's GCC neighbors at the, very, at the very least. So again, that this isn't holding out Iran as some uh, special uh, case. I think that's, that's, that is at least what appears to me uh, uh, the most uh, viable thing, but it's not. It's going to be really hard, and it's not likely going to happen with this tone in this town at this moment. And it's a good thing, therefore, that we have a decade. And certainly important for people like Bob to be thinking about it. Uh, for other questions, do we have more? The panel was so good, no <laughs> one has <laughs> questions. <laughs> can Kelly? Can I just add Please. something on this? I think it's important to think back to bef the, the origin, um, I, I think, of the strong political opposition to the deal in this country, which came from Netanyahu and his appearance in Congress and his criticism, his fierce criticism of the deal before it was finished. That came from, from two sources. It came from a belief that negotiating any deal with Iran gave the Iranian regime more legitimacy. Um, and it came also from a fear shared by the Gulf states that if the nuclear issue got taken care of, then the freeze that had prevailed 
between the United States and Iran since the hostage crisis in 79 would, would begin to thaw. Israel remembers and the Gulf states remember that it wasn't very long ago that the U.S. and Iran had very close relationships under the Shah. Um, and, and that was the opposition really was to any deal. Um, so part of this debate is whether you believe Iran eventually is easier to deal with on the non-nuclear issues as a pariah state um, uh, or as a state that has been brought under the into the international system to a degree. My own view is that pariah states always behave like pariah states because that's their only option. Uh, and that is a big part also of what, besides the nuclear issues, is at stake here. I want to follow up on a question about that to you, Jessica, quickly. One of the criticisms of the deal here in Washington that we hear frequently is that the deal has emboldened Iran in the region, and it's emboldened Iran's activities uh, in other states. It's emboldened its support of non-state actors. How would you respond to that criticism? I think that um, Iran has been uh, playing a larger role, and it's because of two huge gifts the United States gave it over the previous decade, which was to remove its two biggest enemies, the Taliban and Saddam Hussein. Um, that, those two things produced a huge shift in power in the region uh, to Iran's benefit. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, made, made an enormous difference. The other, the, the sort of related argument is that we gave them the money to be more active uh, in support of groups that um, uh, terrorist groups and militias uh, working against U.S. interests, often with U.S. interests and against ISIS. Um, the amount of money that was released, which was Iranian money, uh, frozen assets, is trivial compared to the economic hole that the sanctions produced, and under the most extreme sanctions, Iran found enough money to do those things. So I think the money issue is a red herring, um, but the um, and that the the larger regional role, um, which preceded the deal, um, has is is another red herring. And of course, the third red herring um, is the argument that in a, in a desire to preserve the deal, the U.S. has, has been um, frightened to confront Iran uh, on, on non-deal issues in the region. And of course, this administration is in, President Trump is in the best position to know that that's not true. Uh, so all of those arguments seem built on sand. If, if I could add just one thing, I, I think you, you frequently will hear President Trump himself uh, say that the deal gave them 100 or $150 billion of U.S. taxpayer money. It was neither 100 or $150 billion nor U.S. taxpayer money. But other than that, it's completely factual. <laughs> uh, it was, as we predicted, closer to about $50 billion of Iranian money that were free, uh, unfrozen. The pallets of cash that showed up were also Iranian money, uh, by the way, not uh, taxpayer uh, dollars. And Jessica's exactly right. This, this, it's not about money, okay? Almost all of that money has gone to domestic needs. How do I know? Because Trump's own intelligence officials have testified uh, to that effect, uh, effect uh, to Congress. It's just the reason why they continue, continue to have the money to do this is it's not expensive, all right? The IRGC Codes Force budget is something like five or six billion dollars a year. It's not very expensive. Iran's total military budget is about 15 billion dollars a year, which is 40 percent of Israel's budget, one-fifth of Saudi Arabia's budget, and one-tenth of the GCC military budget. They're not a military juggernaut. The reason why they can create so much havoc is that the types of activities they're engaged in are not expensive, especially in, which is why they could do it under sanctions, and they can do it in an environment of chaos. The Iranians are better at exploiting chaos in the region than we and our allies are of building stability. That's true in Iraq, it's true in Syria, it's true in Yemen, it's true in Lebanon, it, it, it's increasingly true in places like Bahrain. 
And so the solution to that is actually a, a set of diplomatic proposals to end those conflicts, generate power sharing agreements, and generate strategic relationships that allow us to counterbalance and play the game of influence with Iran over the medium to long term, not the approach that the Trump administration has taken. It, it takes a State Department. It takes a diplomatic plan. It takes the ability to actually use leverage and then generate it towards diplomatic ag agreements, which they don't appear to have. And the last point I will make is the most consequential thing to have happened in the last month that helped Iran was what the Kurds did in the referendum and what the and how the Iraqi government and the Shia militia, uh, many of which backed by Iran, how they responded to that, and that was a failure of U.S. diplomacy. So if you're worried about Iran extending its influence and tentacles into places like Iraq or Syria, then focus on and hold the, tr the Trump administration accountable for actually having diplomacy and diplomats. And a regional policy. I, I mean, that we really, we truly don't have a regional policy. Also, I should add, um, Jessica mentioned the U.S. attacking Afghanistan and Iraq and the impact on the regional issues, definitely emboldened Iranian position in the region. But even the U.S. NATO GCC attacking Libya or Saudi Arabia, U.S. attacking Yemen, and the recruiting of tens of thousands of terrorists coming to the region, more important, the vulnerability and the weakness of Arab world. Arab world practically has collapsed. And there is a big vacuum. And Iran and Turkey, they are the two big uh, nations, powers with hundreds, year, hundreds of years or thousands of years of civilization history. And uh, therefore, they are feeling the, the vacuum. This is natural, and I think I, I really share with, with Colin saying the U.S. mistake in the region has, uh, uh, is the main reason why Iran has more influence, but why the region is today is so uh, destabilized and in a tremendous crisis we, have, we see everywhere in the region. So I don't want to end on a depressing note. <laughs> And I think it's important to remind people that Trump did say that as soon as he became president, he would get rid of the Iran deal. It is still in place. I think now we are all much better equipped to push back against some of the arguments for dismantling it or unilaterally renegotiating it. Uh, I would encourage all of you to continue to be involved in this issue, to ensure that your members of Congress know that they have your support in resisting any efforts to unilaterally change the deal. I thank you for all of the work you've done so far, and please join me in thanking our panel.